In 490 BCE, 600 Persian triremes landed on a beach 35 kilometers north of Athens. Standing in their way were 11,000 hoplites led by the prestigious Athenian general Miltiades. The Persian forces outnumber the Greeks approximately five to one, and yet the smaller force managed to push back their would-be conquerors. The Battle of Marathon was a major turning point in the Greco-Persian Wars, and the Athenians' victory would be celebrated for many years. The modern-day distance running event is named a marathon in memory of a soldier from the battle who ran back to Athens to announce their victory, though whether this is real or legend is uncertain. The Persians wanted to invade Greece in part due to its rich silver mines. In 545 BCE, they came closer to this goal after their victory over Croesus, the king of Lydia. The victory forced some Greek populations in Asia Minor to surrender and gave the Persians a solid foothold to carry out a large-scale invasion. In 494 BCE, the city of Miletus revolted against its Persian rulers. They were aided by Athens and the nearby city of Eritrea, and even burned down an important Persian temple. The Persian king Darius was enraged by their sacrilege, and in 491 BCE, sent messengers to the Greek cities demanding their submission. Athens and Sparta killed the Persian messengers, goading Darius to invade. The Persians began their attacks, first capturing the city of Naxos and enslaving its inhabitants, then taking the city of Eritrea. Filled with confidence from their string of victories, the Persians set their sights on Athens. The Greeks were surprised by the ferocity of the Persian attacks. Seeking aid against the upcoming invasion, Athens was forced to appeal to other cities for help. In a surprising move, they asked for aid from Sparta, known for having the strongest army in Greece. The Spartans agreed to the request, but they were unable to send reinforcements in time due to the religious feast of Apollo Carneos, which forbade them from leaving their city until the next full moon. The only extra help Athens managed to acquire was from the small Boeotian city of Plataea, which sent an additional 1,000 hoplites. This was the first time in Greek history that their entire civilization was under attack from an external invader. Despite sharing the same language and same religion, Greek city-states had often warred amongst themselves. The Persian invasion was the first time they realized the necessity of collective action to ensure their survival. The Persian fleet originally planned to land at the port of Phaleron. However, the exiled Athenian tyrant Hippias, who sided with the Persians, advised them to land at Marathon instead, where it would be easier to deploy cavalry. The Athenians were unaware of the Persian battle plans and left Marathon undefended. This allowed the Persians to quietly set up camp on the beach while Athens scrambled to mount a defense. The Persians' overwhelming numerical superiority forced the Athenians to get creative with their defensive strategy. The city sent 10,000 hoplites, along with the extra 1,000 Plataean reinforcements, to a hill located above the Persian encampment. Once in position, Athenians had to decide whether to wait for the Persians to attack or to strike them first. Athens' strategists believed the former option was better but the general Miltiades believed a first strike was more advantageous, as the Persians had their backs to the sea. In the end, Miltiades' opinion prevailed, and the Greeks made their move. According to Herodotus, the Greek forces charged at the Persians without archers or cavalry. The Persians were unprepared for what they saw as an act of madness. While they were able to hold the Greeks back at first, they were eventually pushed back to their ships and forced to retreat. The Persians suffered heavy losses during the battle, with approximately 6,400 casualties. The Athenians, on the other hand, only lost 192 soldiers. The victory at Marathon was considered miraculous. The Greeks attributed this miracle to the appearance of legendary heroes who they allegedly saw return from the dead to fight at their side in defense of the city. For example, several Athenians swore they saw the mythical King Theseus take up arms at Marathon, a scene which would later be depicted in Athens' Agora. Similarly, 
Some hoplites attested that Heracles appeared at Marathon, clad in his lion skin and wielding a club. The supposed appearance of these heroes helped elevate the Battle of Marathon to a legendary status among the Greek people. After the Persians fled Marathon, they tried to invade Athens by way of the Bay of Phaleron. However, this gave the Athenians time to return to their city and mount a proper defense. Fearing further losses, the admiral of the Persian fleet called off their attack, and the Persians returned to their empire. Darius was furious at the campaign's failure and decided to seek vengeance in a retaliatory expedition from both land and sea. Meanwhile, Sparta begrudgingly congratulated Athens on their victory. The victory at Marathon marked the beginning of a new era for Athens. According to Herodotus, Athens' success at pushing back the Persians ranked them first in the ongoing competition between the Greek city-states. The Athenians immortalized their prestige by erecting monuments in both their own city and in Delphi. The Battle of Marathon was also perceived as a blow against tyranny. Tyranny went from being perceived as a simple flaw in authoritarian excess to major treason against the homeland, a sin that rulers would take great pains to avoid being accused of. This helped consolidate the institution of democracy for the next two centuries. The Persian king Darius's cries of rage echoed for years after his humiliating defeat at Marathon. Even after Darius's death, his son Xerxes continued to seek vengeance against the Greeks. According to Aeschylus, Asia was emptied of all its men. Greek spies brought the news of Xerxes's imminent invasion back to their homeland. Afterwards, many discussions were had on the best place to mount a defense. In the end, the Greeks decided on Thermopylae. The area featured a narrow pass that could act as a bottleneck for the Persian army, negating their numerical superiority. It also offered naval advantages, offering the Greek fleets opportunities for flanking. 5,000 Peloponnesian Greeks set up at a fort near the entrance of the narrow passage, otherwise known as the Hot Gates. Leading them was Leonidas, a Spartan king who prided himself on supposedly being a direct descendant of Heracles. Leonidas was accompanied by several elite soldiers who together made up the famous 300 Spartans. The Persian army arrived in the summer of 480 BCE, preceded by a flood of rumors regarding their strength and numbers. It was claimed they consumed 6,000 tons of wheat every day, and that they dried every river and brook they passed to quench their near insatiable thirst. During their march to Thermopylae, the Persians faced no opposition, and in fact, increased their numbers further by recruiting more soldiers from other Greek cities and places like Thrace. According to Herodotus, the last count of the Persian fleet was numbered at 1,207 boats, mounted by approximately 240,000 men. He estimates the land army, meanwhile, was made up of more than one million men. The Greek forces at Thermopylae were heavily outnumbered. Xerxes believed that at the sight of his massive army, the Greeks at Thermopylae would flee in terror. Instead, they deliberated. The majority of the Peloponnesians wanted to engage the Persians on the Isthmus of Corinth. Leonidas, meanwhile, believed it was wiser to stay put in Thermopylae. While the Greek forces debated, a Persian horseman was sent to spy on the enemy. He returned to Xerxes with surprising news. Not only were the Greeks not fleeing, but the Spartans guarding the fort were exercising and combing their hair. A far cry from the fearful soldiers Xerxes expected. To increase the pressure on the Greeks, Xerxes waited four more days, then attacked on the fifth. The Persians faced heavy resistance and suffered many losses, and Herodotus says Xerxes leaped three times from his chair, seized with fear for his army. The following day proved to be just as difficult for the Persian forces. 
and the Greeks continued to stand their ground. The Persians seemed poised to be held at Thermopylae indefinitely until an inhabitant from the region came forward with information. He told the Persians of another route which could take them around Thermopylae. A Persian contingent was sent to verify the information. While there were Greek soldiers stationed to guard the route, they were forced to flee from the Persians. Thus, on the third day of the battle, the Greeks were surrounded by their enemy. With the Persians both in front of and behind them, the Greek forces at Thermopylae realized they had two choices, flee to live another day, or stand and fight till their last breath. Most of the Greeks chose the former option, but some stayed, including Leonidas and his 300 Spartans. For the Spartans, dying a glorious death was one of the highest honors they could achieve. The few members of Leonidas' Spartans who did not participate in the last stand at Thermopylae felt that they had missed an opportunity for honor and either committed suicide or continued living under the mockery and disgust of their fellow citizens. The Spartans' last stand was not only for glory, though. Had they not hold off the Persians, the Greeks' retreating forces would probably have been cut down by enemy horsemen. On the morning of the third day, King Xerxes was assured of his victory. However, that victory did not come easy. King Leonidas himself fell in battle, and a furious fight broke out around his body. The Spartans fought to the last man, and when they had all been slain, Leonidas' body was brought before Xerxes. According to Herodotus, Persians usually honored the most courageous warriors, even if they were enemies. However, Xerxes was so consumed by rage at the Spartans' resistance that instead he cut off Leonidas' head and ordered it impaled on a stake. A statue of a lion was later erected on the hill of the Spartans' last stand in honor of Leonidas' bravery. Though they were victorious, the Battle of Thermopylae shook the morale of the Persian army. They had lost thousands of men, while Greek casualties only numbered in the hundreds. And due to the sacrifice of the Spartans, the rest of the Greek army had been able to successfully retreat and regroup. As a result, even as Xerxes set up camp at the foot of Athens' Acropolis, ready to get revenge for his father's humiliating defeat at Marathon, the Persians were more anxious than confident. They were more aware than ever that the Greeks did not fear them and were ready to die defending their land. In the end, the Battle of Thermopylae was still a loss for the Greeks. However, the battle gave the Greeks a boost in morale that carried them all the way to their decisive victory over the Persians in the Battle of Plataea in 479 BCE. With the war against the Persians finally won, the Greeks were able to honor the sacrifice of Leonidas and his Spartans with memorials and poems, forever solidifying the glory of Sparta's military prowess. The newfound respect for Sparta was noteworthy, because before the war, the city was seen as no more than a bully who forced itself into the affairs of others. Thermopylae changed the opinions of Sparta for the better and gave them a legitimate claim to be one of Greece's most powerful and influential cities. The land that would come to be known as Amphipolis was originally part of Thrace, a region inhabited by formidable semi-nomadic horsemen. Thrace was rich in gold and silver mines. It was surrounded by lush forests, making it very attractive to outside parties like Greece and Persia. By 513 BCE, Persia had managed to conquer much of Thrace. But after their defeat in 479 BCE, Athens made a play for the land. They conquered the nearby island of Thasos in 465 BCE. But the military prowess of the Thracian riders kept them out of the country's interior. It was only in 436 BCE that Athens established a solid foothold in Thrace with the founding of Amphipolis, a city on the banks of the river Strymon. 
During the Peloponnesian War, the Spartan general Brasidas sought a way to subvert Athenian power across the Greek world. He set his sights on capturing the coast of Thrace, hoping to seize the resources the area provided. Brasidas knew that many of the Greeks living in Thrace hated the greed and brutality of their Athenian neighbors and decided to take advantage of the situation. He set off on an expedition to Amphipolis, accompanied by 1,000 hoplites and 700 helots, and arrived before the city in the winter of 424 BCE. At Amphipolis's ramparts, Brasidas announced that he preferred to take the city peacefully and promised to allow safe passage to any inhabitants who wished to leave, in addition to sparing those who wanted to cooperate. This proposal was well received by the city's residents and he was able to capture Amphipolis without striking a single blow. Brasidas's march on Amphipolis blindsided the Athenians. By the time they heard the news and dispatched the general Thucydides to defend Amphipolis, Brasidas had already rallied several nearby cities to help him defend the region from Athens' so-called tyranny. After half a day's journey from Thasos, Thucydides arrived at the port of Aeon, but was unable to retake Amphipolis. Athens held Thucydides responsible for the loss of Amphipolis and forced the general into exile. In spite of Brasidas' achievements, Sparta did not send him reinforcements, which forced the general to negotiate a truce with Athens to hold on to the ground he gained. The matter of how to deal with Amphipolis divided Athens. The politician Nicias, as well as the city of Sparta, hoped that peace could be negotiated. However, the popular Athenian statesman and general Cleon wanted to continue fighting the war. Indecision continued until 422 BCE, when Cleon was elected as one of Athens' strategists. This decision made it clear that the city's people were in favor of war. The truce was ended, and Cleon began his journey to Amphipolis, retaking small towns that had been conquered by Brasidas along the way. On arriving at the port of Aeon, Cleon requested troops from the king of Macedonia. He also hired several Thracian mercenaries to bolster his forces' numbers. Afterwards, all Cleon could do was wait for the remainder of his reinforcements. While they waited, the Athenian forces began to resent Cleon's hesitation to attack. They saw him as soft and incompetent, especially compared to their opponent, Brasidas. Sensing the tension, Cleon decided to act without waiting for reinforcements to arrive. He set out from the port of Aeon to observe Amphipolis, setting up a camp on a nearby hill. To Cleon's surprise, Amphipolis appeared to be completely unprotected, with no guards stationed at the city's gates and ramparts. However, the city's lack of protection was only an illusion. Even so, upon seeing this, Cleon regretted that he did not bring wooden towers, which would have allowed him to easily recapture the city. Brasidas positioned his own troops in a nearby wooded area to get a better view of Cleon's army. When the Athenians began moving to set up camp, Brasidas returned to Amphipolis. He believed his army was less well-trained than the Athenians and decided to rely instead on cunning tactics and Cleon's inexperience as a military leader. Brasidas organized a two-prong attack. He would personally lead a small raid, then one of his lieutenants would follow up with a second attack shortly after, disorienting the enemy. He had barely finished formulating his plan when he saw Cleon's army pack up and retreat back towards the coast. The cowardly display made Brasidas realize that perhaps victory would be easier than he thought. After seeing Brasidas' troops return to Amphipolis, Cleon decided to fall back to the port of Aeon and once again wait for reinforcements. Unfortunately, his exact orders were confusing and contradictory, which left the Athenian forces in disarray. Brasidas took advantage of this confusion and began his attack. Cleon's forces panicked, which made them easy prey for the Spartans. 600 Athenians were killed, while the Spartans only lost seven men. Cleon's remaining forces took refuge in Aeon, where the bodies of their comrades were eventually returned to them, though only after being stripped of their weapons. 
During the pitched battle between the Spartans and the Athenians, both Brasidas and Cleon were killed. The reports of their respective deaths reflect how they were perceived as military leaders. We know almost nothing about Cleon's death, other than that he was killed by a Thracian soldier. Brasidas, meanwhile, survived long enough to be taken back to Amphipolis, where he was informed of his victory. He was buried inside the city, which was considered an honor bestowed only upon heroes, and was celebrated as the true founder of Amphipolis. The Battle of Amphipolis temporarily put an end to the hostilities between Athens and Sparta. The Athenian forces returned to Piraeus, while Sparta called back the reinforcements they'd sent for Brasidas. The death of both Brasidas and Cleon encouraged the two cities to push for peace. The negotiations took time, but Sparta and Athens eventually agreed to return to the way things were before the Peloponnesian War. The resulting treaty became popularly known as the Peace of Nicias. Throughout the Greek world, it was mostly agreed that Sparta had lost the war, in spite of Brasidas' heroic efforts. The sentiment was rooted in the fact that Sparta had failed to end Athens' domination over Greece, something they had promised to do at the start of the war. Since 431 BCE, the Peloponnesian War had been raging between Athens, Sparta, and their allies, with neither side gaining much ground. But in 425 BCE, an Athenian general named Demosthenes changed that. After a storm forced his fleet to stop in Pylos, Demosthenes realized a military presence in the area would give them an advantage against Sparta. Unfortunately, the fleet's strategists did not believe him and left Demosthenes and Pylos with five triremes and 1,000 men. The Spartans, meanwhile, were too busy celebrating a religious festival to notice the enemy on their doorstep. Once Sparta discovered the Athenian presence on Pylos, the Spartan king Aegis mustered his troops and fleet. Sparta then descended on Demosthenes' outpost, attacking from both the sea and the mainland. The Athenian general had to mount a hasty defense. He pulled his boats back to the foot of the ramparts and fixed them in place with stakes, providing extra cover. Then, going against all the established rules of battle, he descended with his hoplites to fight on the rocky shore, where he believed the Spartans would disembark. His gamble paid off, and the Spartans did indeed attempt to land at this location, though Demosthenes' forces made them hesitate. One of the Spartan leaders, Brasidas, decided to make the first move by ramming the rocks with his boat, exclaiming, it's only a few planks. He paid for his actions when his shield slipped into the sea after descending from his boat, leaving him open to many blows. The battle raged on into the night and continued to the next day, remaining locked in a stalemate. However, on the evening of the second day, Athenian reinforcements arrived. The sudden arrival of the Athenian fleet stacked the odds in Athens' favor. The fleet decided to hold off their attack until the next day, when they swarmed the Spartan ships. They successfully captured five enemy ships and damaged many others, cutting off access to the nearby island of Sphacteria. Then, to add insult to injury, the Athenians raised a stake, hung with weapons they'd captured from the Spartans, including the shield of Brasidas. Meanwhile, the 420 Spartans on Sphacteria were trapped, and Sparta was completely helpless to rescue them. With 420 of their men trapped on Sphacteria, Sparta needed to reevaluate their position. The Spartans on the island were essentially the Athenians' hostages, and Sparta could not move to rescue or resupply them without putting their lives in danger. In an effort to save the trapped soldiers, the Spartan leadership negotiated an immediate truce with the Athenian strategists. Sparta agreed to hold back its fleet and halt their attacks on Pylos. And in return, the Athenians permitted them to send supplies to their men. In the meantime, Sparta sent ambassadors to Athens to try and negotiate a better deal. The hasty truce greatly humiliated Sparta, as they were forced to recognize just how helpless their infantry was in the face of an Athenian fleet. To bargain for the safety of their men, Sparta sent ambassadors to Athens to propose a cessation of hostilities. The ambassadors tried to emphasize that their situation 
was not a result of strategic incompetence or lack of strength, but rather plain bad luck. According to them, the Spartans on Sphacteria did not deserve to suffer further because they were trapped through no fault of their own. These statements provoked the ire of Cleon, a popular Athenian politician known for his popular speeches. Cleon insisted that the terms of negotiations be discussed openly before the assembly and the Athenian people instead of in private. The Spartan ambassadors were not as comfortable with public speaking as the Athenians, so they decided to leave. Following the failed attempts of the Spartan ambassadors, hostilities resumed. Back in Athens, Cleon took matters into his own hands. After being elected general, or strategos, he left to join the ongoing battle, accompanied by javelin-armed infantry and archers. With renewed strength and numbers, the Athenians landed on Sphacteria and engaged their enemy. The battle was hard fought, but they eventually managed to surround the remaining Spartans. It was then that Cleon invited the Spartans to surrender, as he hoped to return to Athens with prisoners. The Spartans were exhausted after spending 72 days on the island, so they accepted Cleon's offer and laid down their arms. A Spartan capitulation had previously been unheard of, and the news of their surrender echoed throughout Greece like thunder. The Spartans' capitulation completely changed the course of the Peloponnesian War. Athens used their new prisoners of war as leverage and threatened to execute them if Sparta ever returned to pillage their lands. This gave the Athenians the freedom to conduct their own raids, which were aided further by their eventual seizing of the island of Kythera. Sparta tried to negotiate for peace, but were unsuccessful. Cleon, meanwhile, was emboldened by his victory and continued to gain popularity with the Athenian people. Popularity that translated to power. 